Hi everyone, we're here at our good friend Phil Maneri's, who, uh, in addition to being an outstanding musician, happens to be a world-class repairman, or as they might say in the trade, a luthier. And uh, as you may know, Phil plays bass with uh, Deb and I, and uh, I actually needed my baritone guitar set up. It sat over the winter while I was away in Hawaii, and uh, the neck needs some adjusting. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone. We'll feature our friend Phil in this episode and he can explain a little bit about what he's doing. Thanks. So what we notice here on this right now is it's back bowed. If you look at this, the straight edge is rocking, which means that it's humped like this or like that. Uh, yeah, which is what we don't want. <laughs> right, you can't play that way. It'll buzz like hell down here because this is the bottom of a hill, which is right here. What we want is it to go the other way. So let's just assume that, um, let's assume that there's 200 foot pounds of, of torque with these strings in standard tuning. Probably a little bit more, but just for shits and giggles, that's what we're gonna call it. Okay, so we're over on another bench. This is the uh, neck adjusting station. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, what Phil's gonna do is adjust the truss rod as he was discussing. So this, um, this covers the nut that's up here. If I can get this out of here. Yeah, there's a little cover there, you know, for cosmetic and safety reasons. Don't try this at home. All right. Let's see what we got under here. Come on. And uh, that's the nut cover catching device that Phil's an engineer. Yeah, if you can look in there, you'll see it's an Allen key. Right. So we got to find the right Allen key to snugly fit in there. Because we're going to save these. We're not going to do a bunch of other aesthetic stuff on this guy. I'm turning left, assuming that that is the correct direction. Most of the time it is. Go. So when you detune a guitar like we just did, <clears throat> the neck goes like that because the truss rod is pulling against string tension that is no longer there. Right. Uh, the tension pulling this way is contingent on string gauge and tension plus the tuning that you use. So if you tune a half step down, you have to adjust the, con the truss rod so that it accommodates for slightly less tension than if you were in standard tune. So I just loosened the rod a little bit and what I'm noticing is that I, I can flex this rule a little bit here and it's flexing right here on this fret so what we've got going on here is sort of a subtle S-curve where it's curving up this way and curving down this way. And what that is, is back compression. So <clears throat> when you start squeezing this rod together, sometimes what happens is, is the neck doesn't just flatten out from a standard bow like this. It starts to hitch back on itself over right. here before this part gets flattened out. Okay. And that's what's happening here. You've got back compression going here so what we have to do is loosen this just a little bit more so that this rocking spot right here goes away you hear that mm -hmm. it's rocking right there on the third fret and that's not a high fret it could easily be construed that but if you if you go down these frets one by one the frets themselves are solid they they have similar heights to each other but what you're seeing here <laughs> is really a bow in the fingerboard. And if you looked on the side real close, you could see it down that way too. Yeah. So what we need to do is loosen this just a skosh more and it'll give us more relief maybe than we might want, but you kind of got to do it. This is a beast. You can feel it vibrating the fucking table right now. <laughs> wow. Oh, this is gonna be fun to play. Okay, let's see where we're at. There we go. Okay. So now when I wiggle it, it's touching here and it's touching down here somewhere. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good thing. And that's right a now. good thing. You want to have a little bit of relief in here. <clears throat> You've got a string. If you look at it, when you strike the string, it vibrates like crazy. It's actually rotating like this. And it's pretty huge distance there. That's like almost three quarters of a centimeter there. Right. Um, and and it's got a long way to travel because it's a baritone guitar right. with a longer, what they call scale length. That's right. Which is measured from the nut to the saddle. Mm -hmm. So it also 
rotates like a football. It's fat in the middle and skinny on the end. Uh -huh. And as you fret a note, that football shrinks a little bit and the center of that moves up. Wow. So um, you have to make a little bit of room for that football to fit. If you tried to set a string like this against a super flat fingerboard like this, but it's rotating like a football, it's gonna you buzz. have to have it up really high right. for it to not buzz right down here. Whereas if you take the neck and give it a little bit of bow, and I'm exaggerating here, but you give it a little bit of bow, then that football has room to move, you see? Right. And that's what we're looking for. So let's check for back compression again. See how well we did. Yeah, that's not moving. There, uh, maybe a little bit. I'm gonna make the uh, make the truss rod uh, settle in a little bit and let's see if that yeah. changes things. Yeah, that did it, okay. Got maybe a spot right there, but I think this is good. Let's go with that. Okay. Yeah, let's go with that. All right, let's see where we're at down here on the other end. Oh, let's turn and around. keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, Phil's a master. How long have you been a repairman and luthier, Phil? Oh, that's a good question. It's not 40 years, but over 35. And uh, Phil had a repair shop for and, and a, a small store for years on Fifth Avenue called, lo and behold. Fifth Avenue Fret Shop. And uh, like a lot of things during the pandemic, he thought, you know what? I've got this expensive place and I have this uh, beautiful home. So he moved his workshop down in the basement and he's fully equipped. Uh, and he's not sure to work either. He's got all kinds of jobs going on while Phil is twiddling with that. And he's got some very impressive clientele, some that you definitely have heard of before, international stars, and local guys like me. And tell people how they can get in touch with you, Phil. Oh, you can text me. <clears throat> um, you can text me at 614-565-0675. And we should mention that, uh, that Phil is in the, what is this area Central called? Central Clintonville. Yeah. Clintonville, so. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Wow. All right, put that down and play this. Okay, so we are here in Phil's uh, restoring painting area. Tell us what's happening here, Phil. Uh, this is a 70s uh, Les Paul, and um, very often the peg heads break off of these things. Yeah, it's the Achilles heel of a Les Paul, right? <clears throat> so here, uh, I put this one back on. It was completely off. Wow. Uh, I put it back on, and now I'm trying to match the paint and clean it up and make it look like it hadn't happened. Which is a real skill, you know, by it the takes way. takes a while, yeah. Because you can get a, a, a structural repair or a cosmetic one, and most people don't want to see it to be reminded. Right. But also, uh, usually... We have to be careful been... of that, too, because you want to leave the serial number if you can. Right. And when you're painting it, so you can't get a bunch of paint in there or it'll just flatten it out. But the good news is, like, you look, you can't even see where it was broken. No, but the really. good, and he's still going to blend that. But the good news is, when I once a headstock repair is effected, then the joint is usually much stronger than it was originally. Indeed. 
Indeed. And, and what is this cool thing here? That's a 55 Les Paul Special that I'm rebuilding. Uh, it came to me with a big hole in it right here where somebody had inlaid a piece of brass thinking a bridge would sound better, <laughs> sunk in a piece of brass. Right. <laughs> so, so I took the brass out and inlaid a piece of lumber that matched up wow. and then sort of matched up the grain. You, you can't even see that. If you look at the grain, yeah. it's like, I wouldn't know. I didn't know that. I mean, I looked at this, yeah. but I couldn't tell there was... A big honk at one so point. It's it's really had the shit kicked out of it over the years. Lots of dings and crunches and bangs and stuff. So I'm doing a relic paint job on it where in the end it's going to look like somebody had kicked the crap out of it over the last 60 years. Right on. Uh, real dark shades where the ambers are like ugh, almost gross like tobacco-y. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, it looks really wicked. And then it'll be cracked up and, yeah. you know. All right. So it's all cracked up that it's cracked up to be. Indeed. Now... This is something to behold. This is cool. What do we have here? Let tell our friends what we have here, Phil. This is a 1948 Gibson Super 400. Uh, in 1948, it cost 400 bucks, and it was the most expensive, most labor-intensive guitar Gibson made at the time. So look at that beautiful. That's maple sides. Yeah, maple sides in back. Uh huh. Wow. Look at that. So. That's interesting. There's sort of a bird's eye quilted mm -hmm. on the back, and then the flamey, the, the flamey fiddleback tiger, mm -hmm. whatever you might want to call that. And this is a solid spruce top that's been carved, just like a, a violin, a mandolin, or <clears throat> violin, mandolin, viola, cello, double bass. Wow, that's a beautiful thing. And mm -hmm. it's funny uh, because if you look at it now, it's in pretty smoky. Mm -hmm. Kind of neglected. Someone brought this to fill, mm -hmm. to repair, and uh, decided they didn't want it. So Phil bought it, and he's going to restore it for himself. So what what has happened here is there was a pickguard here. It was pretty big. Oh, yeah, let me... And the pickguard was made out of celluloid. And like the old movies that were made out of celluloid, that eventually you open up the canister and they're dust. That's what happens here. When it decomposes, it becomes dust. You can see the rel or remnant of the dust on this screw right there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the you can it, see where the celluloid, yeah, where it attached the pickguard, and the pickguard would have been shaped, yeah, going pretty big. Okay. Yeah, and so when it when it decomposes, it gases off as acetylene, and when it does that it ruins all the metal anywhere near it. So if this is sitting in a case like this one was, and yeah, if you look here, so that's the gas that creates this corrosion. Right. And you look at that, it's like I got barnacles on my fingerboard and frets. But now... And that's the case all the way down here too, in the, the tailpiece, this is supposed to be screaming gold, and it's yeah, not. Yeah. It's like totally rusted out. You can barely see Super 400 written on it's it. It's kind of a rat rod uh, 400 right. then, isn't it? The patina is kind of cool. I mean... I think as a, a customer and a luthier, you always have the struggle, well, do we leave it as is? Because I think it looks kind of cool. Right. Now, you know, most people who play these kind of guitars, they want them to be pristine. But to me, there's something really charming about that natural aging that's yeah. occurred on there. Uh, but boy, what a fine looking instrument. This was made in Kalamazoo by old school craftsmen. Can you turn it back, turn it over, Phil? We'll have a look at the back and the neck. Holy cow. Okay, let's go up here. Now, this is interesting here, this inlaid trapezoid, mm -hmm. the diamond, the Gibson diamond. And they only use these for a handful of years, too, these tuners. Yeah. Very rare, very cool. Very beautiful. But look at this neck. Oh, look at that piece of wood. That's what we call guitar porn. Mm -hmm. oing, 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 oing. <laughs> <laughs> But, I mean, luckily, remarkably, like the binding, and you can see what Phil was talking about, how this was a, it still is a high-end, desirable Super high-end. They took guitar. a long time to work on this thing. I mean, there's multi-layer binding on there. And at one point, that would have been an ivory color, and look how mm -hmm. it's yellowed through the ages. But mm -hmm. that's a desirable thing, actually. But, oh, my goodness, what a beautiful thing. And it's, like, crack-free and... Mm -hmm. I think there might have been one here yeah, that somebody fixed at some one, point. The, maybe the best. This is solid, but it's not quite made it up right. I'll probably leave that alone. So the 1948 solid. Gibson Super, Super 400. 400. So, wow. I don't know. I'd almost be inclined to leave it like that, Phil. Yeah. Well, I gotta fix this. You can't. You can't play it very well. Well, yeah. So I would probably refret it. But I mean, it's. Very cool. Thing. Wow. 
It's got that sound too, for sure. Yeah. All right. Now, you know, most people will know the Telecaster is near and dear to me. And this is one that Phil built a long time ago. And I'll let him explain how that came about. Well, it's it's sort of new old stock, really. Uh, my The fret shop was in, in, in the same place for like 25 years. And um, early on in that period of time, we made tellies and strats that we sold. And they, they didn't do very well, so I, I didn't keep doing them. But they were great guitars, and people who have them still generally hold on to them. It's, this is badass. <laughs> so when I moved out of that space <clears throat> a year and a half ago, uh, I discovered some bodies and necks laying around that I had intended to build into guitars, but never did for one reason or another. This one in particular was a double bound with a lovely quilted top, but the back was all just beat to crap. So I just went ahead and blacked it out so that you couldn't see any of the defects of it. I've already scratched the shit out of it since I've had it, since I built it, but um, shot this burst over it, made it look antique. Uh, it's got a uh, set of Fralins in here. This Lindsay is a Fralins, a great pickup maker. I have them in my tellies, both my Han and my Rick Kelly. Mm -hmm. This is a blue special, reverse wound, so that it'll match up well with this pickup, which is an unbucker. It's an unbalanced humbucker. This, co uh, this the slug coil side is a 5K coil, and this is a 3K coil. Usually, they would be balanced, 4K and 4K. Oh, wow. This is unbalanced on purpose so that when you coil tap it by pulling this up, it exposes this as a standard tele neck, neck pickup. Oh, that's very cool. So when you're in the tweener, with this up, it's a tele, standard tele. And when you put this down and you go in the neck position, you've got basically a Les Paul. So we should mention that the, uh, you know, the person who really started using the humbucker in the neck position was Keith Richards. Absolutely. And, um, you know, he's got a lot of Telecasters with uh, that going on, with the humbucker and then this traditional one. Uh, so this, like the guitar we were just working on, is a baritone. It's a 28-inch yeah. scale. I mean, you can hear it now, it's not even yeah. plugged in. And see, that's always a sign of a really good, any guitar, acoustic obviously, but electric, yeah. you know, if you, you get a, a nice electric guitar and you just strum it unplugged and it rings, you know, the catchphrase these days is it resonates. Yeah. Uh, that means it's a good one. You know, if it sounds good unplugged, it's going to sound phenomenal when it's plugged in. That's right. No matter what pickups you put in it, yeah. whatever electronic treatments you want to do, it's always going to sound it, sonic it, energy from two pieces to each other. We were looking at this. This is a very cool Japanese guitar. I mean, it looks cool, right? It's got these, these pickups sound great. They're like mm -hmm. kind of single coils, but a customer brought this to Phil. It looks like the head shop, the, the head shop, boy, there's a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> the, look at that kind of faux tortoloid right. pit guard. Tortoloid. And there you go. That's a blend frappe. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But this smoothie, thing is so funky. Ice. Yeah, smoothie. <laughs> this thing is so funky. But we were talking about the neck pocket, and Phil said... One of the problems is, I mean, I'm going to try and hold that without getting too nerdy. You can see this is much lower than over here. So the neck, you can see the old shadow on it. It just doesn't really sit in there properly. So Phil's going to engineer it so everything is snug and tight. Because, again, that'll help with the vibration of the yeah, sounds. Yeah, it has a right angle, too, so that it approaches the bridge in, in a proper angle. Look at that thing. That's out of a Godzilla movie, isn't right? it? And it doesn't have much room to move, so you got to get the neck angle dead on. So this looks like this thing is probably from the mid to late 60s? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I love the F-holes. The F-holes, yeah. That's they look crazy like cool. dinosaurs. Right? That thing is badass, too. I mm -hmm. mean, it's what they would call a pawn shop guitar, but when Phil's done with it, the owner will be very happy, I'm sure. Indeed. All right, so we're here in Phil's kitchen. Some of you may have recognize this table it's missing some pickles though yeah i don't during the pandemic this. phil did many streams from here and with his son vince and uh great stuff 
But we're going to talk to Phil a bit, a little bit about his uh, music and his background with that and what he's doing um, currently. Oh my, that's a big long thing. But uh, I've been playing the bass most of my life and guitar and piano and such. Um, been in a gazillion different bands uh, over the years. And, you know, I see myself as a musician first and then the luthier thing was sort of a, a, an extension of that. I was a broke musician and I needed to fix my broken stuff. So I learned how to fix it and then that became its own separate thing. And so both are parallel paths. Uh, I, of course, I've played with Colin. I've played with all kinds of people, rock, jazz, folk, singer-songwriter stuff. Um, been on a bunch of records. Um, lately, what I've been doing, <laughs> there's this. I love this thing. This thing. <laughs> and I thought, oh, cool. It's like a little paperweight. And Phil said, no, it is. Look at that. AirPods Pro case. <laughs> So but no good. pickles still, damn no, it. No, no pickles. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I, yeah, tell I'm, people about uh, the Vandarelli Room and Kaleidoscope. Uh, Vandarelli Room is an art gallery in uh, Franklinton here in Columbus. Um, they have, you know, rotating art exhibits every month. Um, one of the things that I've started to do there uh, is uh, um, Kaleidoscope. It is a um, immersive experience where uh, there are musicians playing, there's an artist uh, painting or creating whatever their art is. Uh, there's uh, dancers dancing. Uh, there is uh, a video uh, projectionist projecting video and light treatments. It's a real multimedia experience. All at the same time. And it's all completely improvised. So and it's being made up on the spot. I did uh, a session with Phil there a couple of years ago and we had a great time. It, it was really fun because it was completely free form. Yeah. And then there's always this, uh, we'll do like a, a period of time where we'll play and then we'll stop and then we'll have a QA and a with the people who are there. And uh, what I've noticed with those is that people really get a sense of what we're doing by asking questions and um, delving into our mindset behind why we chose this or that. or um, uh, it, it, So they end up leaving knowing a lot more about the process and uh, the structures of things. Yeah, very cool. So, Phil, I wanted to thank you for taking the time to uh, speak with us today. Mm -hmm. And uh, ladies and gents, you can see Phil is our shameless plug um, on <laughs> Saturday for our Akron area friends, Saturday, April 12th, is that, I believe? Something like that. At the Mustard Seed in Akron in Highland Square. That doesn't sound right. No, there's something wrong with that. The 16th, that's when it is. Saturday, April 16th yes, at the Mustard, Mustard Seed Holly Square with Long Tall Deb, myself, Chris Butler, and Phil. And then here in Columbus on Saturday, the 23rd of April That's right. at Natalie's in Worthington. And we would really appreciate your support if you're able to. We appreciate your support by being here and uh, supporting our Patreon efforts and now we're able to start doing some live things again but uh we like doing these sort of insider things because this is strictly for you guys and uh there you go see what that says that's phil's mantra <laughs> but that means good that's a good thing mm -hmm. right on all right everyone thanks phil